further ado, right now we're going to bring in live, 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 the man of the hour. Of course, we already said it. This should, the episode is entitled After Him, The Return of Richard Bay. Bringing him right now, <laughs> former host of his show from the 1990s, Richard Bay. Welcome, brother. Oh, yes. This is my big comeback, huh? <laughs> How you doing, man? How you doing? Uh, I'm doing fine. I'm down in Florida at the moment. I go back and forth now between Florida and New York. So I'm living on the beach, and uh, it's it's fine. Uh, I do some radio, you know. I did, uh, uh, you know, I was after the TV show, I was on the radio in New York. I was on Sirius uh, XM, and I was on... Um, uh, one of the WWRL in New York. I did a movie with Sasha Baron Cohen, but right now I'm just, uh, you know, kind of taking it easy and enjoying life. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. How are you guys doing? Doing, doing, well. doing well. Yeah, it was it was fun while it lasted. <laughs> well, the, uh, what part of Florida are you currently um, in right now? Um, I'm in Delray Beach, but uh, I live right on the beach. So when I step out the door, I'm right on the beach, you know. I go running every day. I go swimming. I go down and read at the beach at sunset. It's it's nice, but I go back to New York usually for a week or two every month and hang out. You know, almost all my friends are back in New York. Sometimes I do some work up there, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I love New York. I consider myself a New Yorker, but uh, New York has changed a lot too. You know, every, you know, in the few years that I've been down here, it's a completely different place. It's now, a, it's now a city for billionaires and tourists. Mm-hmm. Cool. See, well, I want to give a first. We're going to ask out of tradition, what would you like for us to call you, Richard Bay, Richard, Mister Bay, Mister Richard? What do you want us to you give call you? Call me. You can call me anything you want. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, game, I've been game called boy. every name in the book, so you know you can. <laughs> yeah, don't call him Jerry Springer, though. That's wrong. That's yes, the best. just don't call me Jerry Springer. I once had a cop put in a police report, <laughs> and uh, he identified me as Jerry Springer. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that, man. That, that, oh wow! That, here, you want to hear a good story? Sure. Okay, go ahead. I'm, I'm in L.A. I just shot an infomercial. I'm coming back to my car, and. All of a sudden, uh, you know, it's dark. I'm on a side street. A guy trips me, and the guy has a gun, uh, you know, right in my face. And he goes, give me a kiss. Give me a kiss. And I said, I put my hands up, and I said, I don't know what the F you're talking about, man. <laughs> I said, what are, you, what are you asking me? And he goes, give me a kiss. So I said, I said the first thing that came on my mind, I said, you know who I am? And that guy with the TV show on Channel 13, because that's what it played in L.A., and his friend right. came up behind him and said, yeah, man, that's him. Come on, let's go. And so they left. They went across the street, and the guy was under the street light. He put his hand in his pocket, and I said, man, if he asks me for an autograph, I'm going to flip. But he pulled the gun out again, points the gun at me, and goes, give me a kiss. So I said, I don't know what the F you're talking about. And he goes, be cool, man. Be cool. I said, you be cool. You got the gun. So they disappear. And this was unbelievable. Like, two, this never happened, especially in L.A. 30 seconds later, L.A. County sheriffs come down the street. And I go running up, waving my arms. Stop, stop. Two guys just had a gun. You know, they, you know, mm-hmm. they, they didn't get anything. But the cop goes, hey, man, you're the guy on TV. And I said, yeah. Right. He goes, where do they find these people? Because that's what I used to say. So I said, let's find these people, man. They went down the alley. So we go down the alley, and they said, and we didn't find anything. And they said, listen, we've got to turn you over to LA, uh, LAPD because this isn't a sheriff's uh, matter. So they call in LAPD. LAPD comes. They're like the Adam 12 cops, you know, wearing sunglasses at night, crew cut. You know, and so the guy goes, Mr. Bay, let me show you what those stupid sheriffs sent to Sacramento. And he pops up the police report on their computer screen, and it says, Jerry Springer, victim of attempted mugging in West 
Damn. He said, they thought you were Jerry Springer. So anyway, I got on wow. the plane. I'm on the red eye. I go back to New York, uh, and I'm getting in makeup, and I'm telling the story, and I'm going, man, I don't know what these guys were talking about. They kept saying, give me a kiss, give me a kiss. And so she said, were they black? Were they white? Were they Spanish? And I said, well, they were, yeah, they were, they were Hispanic. And she said, and you didn't give them your keys? And I, she said, they were saying, give me a keys, give me a keys. I thought they were saying, give me a kiss. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But, you know, Richard, you, you can cast on this show. Our show is unrated, so we're late night like you. You say whatever you want, drop F-bombs. It's no fun. Oh, I can. Okay. Show. All right. Okay. All right. Yeah. I, was, I was trying to clean it up because I didn't know whether I could get you in trouble or not. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nah. no. You can't get us in trouble. I, cer- <laughs> I, certainly, didn't say, I certainly didn't say what the F are you talking about. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I can imagine. I'm, I'm glad that you're okay, though. We're, we're glad that, you know, you're. Yeah, me you too. Know, yeah, <laughs> glad that you're okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely. Well, well, Richard, we do thank you for coming on to the show. It is an honor to have you on. A lot of a lot of our fans um, all around mm-hmm. like, oh, I remember Richard Bay, I remember him. Or some people are like, wait, his face looks familiar. And, of course, uh, you know, our media assistant, who calls our team, was like, dude, he had the sound effects on the show. Like, shut up, sit down. And people right, messaging right. me from high school, like, wait, I remember that <laughs> show. He had that, the concoctions and all that crazy <laughs> shit going on. Like, yeah, that, that's him. The Wheel of Torture. That, Right. Yeah. Yes. Good, good old stuff. Well, um, yeah, to start things out, Richard. Um, tell us first, how did the show come about? Um, how what were the origins of the show? Uh, was it, was it your idea? Was did someone come to you and pitch your idea of the show? And um, how did you come up with that kind of style? No, we started. You know, in the beginning, uh, I'd been in Phil. I was in Philly for four years. I I replaced Maury Povich in Philly. And so I was there for four years, and then I came up to New York, and I did the same show. It was called People Are Talking. Now, you had that in, in Baltimore. You're from Baltimore, right? Whoa. Oh, yeah, we're here. Yeah. We're here. Yeah, we're uh, here. Baltimore. You guys are in Baltimore? Yeah. Richard yeah. Baltimore. Right? All right. You remember People Are Talking with Richard Schur and Oprah Winfrey? Yeah. 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 Right? That was a really long That was in the 80s. That was now, the 80s. Yeah. I, I did People Are Talking in Philly. So, you know, you know, it was the same company, but they had the same show in every, uh, you know, in every market. They had New York. They had uh, not New York at that time. They had Boston, Philly, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, and they had the same show in all these places. So I was on People Are Talking in Philly. Then I came to New York, and I did People Are Talking in New York. Now, that show was more like a Donahue show, you know, celebrities, current events, uh, you know, long interviews, like the one they had in Philly. So anyway, pretty soon all these other shows popped up, and they were all doing the same thing, imitating, uh, you know, Phil Donahue, really. And my show, we used to have the best guests, man. If something broke... In the New York papers that morning, we had them live on the on the set, and the show was live. But pretty soon, Maury, Jerry, people forget Jerry started off doing like a serious Donahue style show, and they had Maury, and you had Donahue, and you had uh, who was uh, Sally Jesse Raphael, and they were all doing pretty serious kinds of shows. So, you know. For us to compete, we were a local show. We didn't have the same budget. And they were paying all these people to come on their shows. So one day somebody said, why don't we do a show with newlyweds? We had guest cancels. She said, why don't we do a show with newlyweds? And then we'll play like a version of the newlywed game, but, you know, make it a little more, you know, sexy. So, you know, I did the gagging reflex with my finger in my mouth. And I said, oh, this sounds so stupid. But we did it, and the next day, we had, the ratings went through the roof. So we started off just doing games, you know, with people. Have people come on, tell real stories, then do games. And from there, I was originally an actor, so I started playing characters. I was Detective Dick Bay. I was Judge Bay with his court of no appeal. I was Sergeant 
cafe with this uh, wimpy uh, hus- platoon of wimpy husbands, and it just became this show that, and, and you know, I, oh, and I went into uh, the the sound guy, and I said, you know what, I love, I said, why is it that radio always feels like it's happening just when you're listening to it, you know, when a DJ's on, you feel like he's talking right to you, when you know. When Stern is doing something outrageous, you feel like you're there just watching it. I said, I said, you know, why can't we get that sort of feeling on a TV show? And I said, you know, a lot of times on radio they use all these crazy sound effects and stuff. I said, why, you know, why don't you just put them on the TV show? Nobody's doing this. But, you know, make a commentary, you know, showing that when, you know, we're just having fun. We're not taking this thing seriously. And that's where the sound effects came from. And uh, and it just built and built. You know, one day somebody said, uh, you know, why don't we, it wasn't me, somebody said, why don't we bring in pies and get people pied? And then I came up with the idea of the wheel of torture, put somebody on this wheel and spin them around, and their girlfriend gets to throw gook all over them. And, uh and, you know, it just sort of evolved organically. Nobody really told us to do that, and nobody told us not to do it. And we just did it, and uh, we sort of got – it was like one of those things where you go, wow, nobody in the corporate management is watching what we're doing, so we could do whatever we want. And the audience seems to love it. So that's how it started. Wow. Oh, oh man! <laughs> that started in Philly too, of all places, huh? Yeah, yeah we well, been going to Philly a lot. Jeez. Yeah. Oh really? Yeah, I, I love yeah. Philly, man. Philly was one yeah, of Philly's my favorite great place. places. Yeah, great, great place. And it's really, uh, it's really a friendly place, man. It's, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I to me when I and it's like a small town. It's like everybody knew everybody else. I would, I guess, compared to New York. But it's like, especially if you're on television, if you're on tele- local television in Philly, you know, they treat you like you're Tom Cruise walking down the street. Oh, my God, Richard Bay, hey, how are you? You know, the, the people are just, uh, you know, they just take you to heart. So, yeah, I had a great time living. I bought a house. That's the first place I ever bought a house was in Philly. And I had some great girlfriends. They've got some so they've got some great women there. I know the song is about Kansas <laughs> City, but they got some pretty little women there. Uh, I had a great uh, time in Philly. I mean, you know, a couple of the women that I'll always regret as, uh, you know, some of the great loves of my life came from Philly. Oh, well, that's, that's, yeah. that's, that's good. That's a good way to remember them. You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> We don't, unfortunately, we don't have a sound effect for that, but we we understand. <laughs> yeah, we can imagine the sound effect. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but how what, is um, Baltimore? How is Baltimore doing? It's getting better, believe it yeah. or not. That's um, good. Yeah, the, the the Department of Justice had found out that um, there's been a lot of discrimination against African Americans oh, and Blacks, in um, the last few years which is the uprising of last year. And, um, right. you know, communities are working together. I I, um, I got pulled over last week, believe it or not. And well, a cop I can was believe more it. Interest- oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it comes with being black. But, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I got pulled over, and, um, you know, he was just um, a white guy, and he was just talking to me, and he was just asking me, like, little questions and stuff. And he was just like, you know, how are you feeling and everything? I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm good. How are you feeling? You know, <laughs> like everything right, he well. said, I repeated, you know. <laughs> like, that's you know, you doing saying. good or you doing good, you know. Well, that's <laughs> but, that's an improvement, isn't it? It's <laughs> yes, yes, it is. It is. Un- unfortunately, there are there are a few stories that, that, that goes through the cracks. I mean, there, of course, it's, it's much, much more work that needs to be done. You know, right. but that's everywhere. You know, everywhere right, that there's right. poverty and, and people with, you know, we have a, a high unemployment rate here, and you know, we have a lot of uh, children who don't have places to play and don't have no after school programs and stuff. You know, it, it, it gets hard. But right. I, I will say I do see some silver lining, some little glimmer of hope 
So I'm not going to just say, oh, it's just, you know, it's, 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 it's a work in progress. So it's slow motion. All right. Well, well, that's good. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You do. We don't get, we'll get that often from our guests. <laughs> right, I'm, I'm, always, I'm always interested. You know, Philly had its uh, – it's problems too, but it was also a, a place where people had a lot of pride in where they were from, and you know they. I, it was a great music town, Philly, when I lived there. You know, Will Will Smith and uh, uh, Jazzy Jeff were from Philly, and the whole uh, what was it, Teddy Pendergast, and um, there was one music studio where I used to do recordings for the TV show when I lived in Philly. And that was a place where some of the great uh, R&B uh, uh, music came out of in the 60s and 70s. So, you know, Philly, Philly had a, a great connection to music. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, the, so the show is, uh, I, I, I keep thinking someday somebody's going to go, hey, man, this show started it all. This show started mm-hmm. the whole reality television <laughs> thing that is now... Just you know, off the chain here. You know, we gotta. Right. Somebody will say that, and they'll go, "Wow, look back at this." Because this is, there wouldn't be all of this other stuff if, if it didn't start with this. But uh, I'm still mm-hmm. waiting for that day. Maybe I'll maybe I'll be 90 years old, and somebody will come up and uh, give me some kind of award. You know. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, yeah. Now, if you if you can, Richard, talk to us about as far as the sound effects. And those are something that everybody remembers. You know, shut up, sit down, and um, you know, right. all those. Talk about um, how did that come about, and how did you come about getting the sound effects? Who did them? Well, there was a guy named Walter Cranston. He was the sound engineer, and you know, I said to him, "Why don't we put sound effects into the show? Like, let's use it like they do on radio." You know, I listen, it wasn't an original idea, but how many times, you know, on a radio show or on Stern they would do it or sometimes DJs would do it, you know, they'd you know, they'd have uh you know, Frankie Crocker would go, Oh, Frankie right. you know or the sound of the woman having an orgasm or something like that. So you know, I said, Go see what you can do and, and Walter you know, I I really just told him to go with it. And Walter, the sound effects guy really put all those sound effects together. And sometimes he would, uh, he, you know, he would just, he would take something from the show and record it. Um, and then somebody, somebody would say something funny, but there was that other one too. You're busted. Remember that one? (laughs) That was when, uh, that was when the guy, you know, when the girlfriend found out that her boyfriend was cheating, <laughs> right. Walter would play, "You're busted." <laughs> and, yeah, it was. It was all supposed to be like, you know, this. They were all just crazy. Everybody, everybody does crazy things to some extent. Of course, look at us now. We have a crazy person running for president. You know, who would ever think that it would? You know that that we would get to this uh, area on the national stage. You know, it's it's pretty unbelievable. It's, it's yeah, it's embarrassing. embarrassing. It's unbelievable. It's one thing to do it on a silly TV show, which is supposed to be silly, but it's another thing to have a guy. They ought to have sound effects for Trump. You know? Yeah. That was, yeah. That was, oh my goodness. <laughs> During his speeches, you know, <laughs> you're trying, you're trying to interpret the, the 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 gibberish that really comes out of his mouth half the time. And it's just, unbelievable. Dis- disrespect, man. It's, it's yeah, it's crazy. And and not only that, the way he'll start, he'll say something, and then an hour later he'll say the exact opposite thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it just goes to show you. Man, if your daddy's rich and your mom is good looking, you've got it made. You don't have to have any real intelligence or talent, you know? If if somebody's right. willing to leave you two hundred million dollars, it's hard to fuck it up. It's hard to fuck up your life. You really have to work hard at it, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, 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 what do you, what do you 
what, what are your thoughts, Richard, on uh, Hillary? I know everybody despises Trump. They look at Trump as a heel. But what are your thoughts on Hillary? Well, my thoughts on Hillary are she wouldn't have been my first choice. Uh, you know, I voted for Bernie Sanders. I sent money to Bernie Sanders. But Hillary is competent. She at least lives in the same world that I do. Uh, I think that people are going to have to watch her ass once she's elected. But I, I don't think there's much of a choice, you know, in terms of voting for him or voting for her. You know, and I think this, I think if we can get some good people in Congress, I mean, you have somebody good running for the Senate there, don't you? There's some hmm. woman I always see on TV in in, in Maryland. No. Uh, mm-hmm. when did she lose? I'm not sure. Well, she I thought she was running. Maybe she was running in a primary. I'm not sure. For mayor. But, you know, News for the primary. No, no, no. I thought for Senate. No. Oh, the I Senate. She was oh. gonna, yeah, mm. I forget. Donna, somebody, isn't it? Oh, I Donna forget. Edwards. Donna uh, Edwards, isn't she running for Senate or not? No? I think yeah, she, she lost. Running. She lost. She was running. Oh, she, she lost? lost? Yeah, mm-hmm. she lost to um, Vic, Van Hoven. Van, Van Hoven. Oh, 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 okay. she lost. Yeah, well, yeah. he's not terrible. That's the way I feel about it. He's not terrible, but she would have been great, mm-hmm. uh, in, in my opinion, you know? So, um, oh, she lost. Well, you know what? I think there are going to have to be some good senators and representatives, and they're going to have to come up with some good legislation and get her to sign it. Listen, the president can only do so much. I mean, look at Obama. He's tried. He's tried. They stop him at every point. They don't pass anything. If you get a Republican House and a Republican Senate, you know, you know, actually the first, the first term, and I voted for Obama both times, and this is the first time that I've ever really loved a president and respected him as a president, uh, as both a human being and a president, since since John F. Thank Kennedy. You. And it, when John F. Kennedy was president, first of all, I didn't know half the shit he was doing. And second of all, <laughs> I, was about, I was about 11 years old, so I didn't know any better. But this is the first president, man. I'm going to be so sorry to see him go. And, you know, uh, both on a personal level and on a political level. But the first, uh, you know, the, his first uh, four years, he kept trying to work with these Republicans. I, ca- I kept saying, man, don't you get it? This is like Independence Day when they capture the alien and the scientists come in, they have him in the glass, and they have the alien mm-hmm. on the other side, and they go, well, just tell us, what do you want us to do? What what would you like us to do? And the alien goes, die. I said, these people don't want to work with you. They don't. They want to destroy you. You cannot keep reaching out to them, you know? And, you know, I think in his second term, he got it. Uh, but, you know, the first two years in his first term, he had a Democratic Senate and House. So they got a lot of, but after that, the Republicans just sat down and said, we're going to hold the line here. There's going to be nothing coming out of here that's going to you know, help this guy or help the country or do anything. And there's only so much. I mean, he has his executive orders. And then you get the right. conservative courts that, that strike them down, you know. So right. he accomplished a hell of a lot considering what he had to work with. Mm-hmm. I, I thank so, you. It, Thank yeah, you, thank you, you really do. Go ahead, well, you thank don't him. have to thank me. Thank him. Thank him. He's well, a great well, I, man. I, I thank I thank him because I, I also voted for him, and I know that uh, Tech and the rest of our staff has voted for him. But it's, it's good to know that someone of your stature has recognized what he's done. You know. Oh, let me Fox tell you News, something. Fox News In New and York, them, they they still bash <laughs> bash Obama all the way out the door. You know. Oh, you never find another yeah, guy I like know, that. Yeah, I know, but I, come on, it's idiotic. He was born in Kenya. Oh, cool. He's a socialist. Uh, his father was, you know, was, was not really a, all this stuff. It's so ridiculous. But I have to tell you something. What my last uh, you know, radio gig in New York, I worked at a place called WWRL, and there were only two white guys in the whole station. 
everybody. Yeah. It was a black-owned station, you know, uh, almost completely black uh, uh, personnel. And Mark Riley, I don't know if you ever heard of him, but he's a great no. host. I was paired with Mark no. Riley. He used to be on Air America. And um, I probably shouldn't say Well, I could say it now, I guess. But anyway, Obama, was, I, and I was an Obama supporter during the primary. Mm-hmm. And okay. I'd sit there, and I'd say we had about a 70% black audience listening. And I would say almost all of the callers, were Hillary supporters and not Obama supporters. My own wow. TD, who was a Caribbean black guy, said Obama's not going to win. I, you know, we had a bet, Starbucks bet. When, you know, whoever won, we'd have to buy the other person Starbucks. Fortunately, I won because I said Obama's going to beat her and Obama's going to be a great president. And so I asked Mark Riley. I said, Mark, I don't get this, man. Time, there's a possibility that a black guy could be president and he's a great guy and he's smart as a whip and he's a nice guy and he's got no scandal and every, every black person calling up is supporting Hillary. So I said, during the commercial break, I said, can you explain this to me? So we were during the commercial break and Mark Riley said, don't ask me to say this on the air, but he said, I think with our audience, it's one of their fundamental truths that the black guy can never get ahead. So they just don't believe that he can do it because, you know, they haven't seen it. So they're going to go with Hillary, who's going to be the winner. And fortunately, Obama was the winner because uh, he was a great president. I wish he, I wish he could go another term. I'd vote for him for another term. I hope Hillary appoints him to the Supreme Court, you know? Mm-hmm. He's just and – when, and when they spoke at the convention, the two of them, I said, man, there must be a God because how did these two people – meet each other, and get married because their speeches, both of them, blew everybody else out of the water. I mean, her speech was, I'm, I'm, my, my hair, uh, my neck is standing up now thinking about her speech. She was just incredible. And his speech was almost as good, but it was certainly up there too. And these two people are so smart, and their parents, and they're, you know, they're intelligent people, and they're, you know, they're visionary people. They're both leaders. I wish she would have run for president instead of Hillary. But, you know, Hillary is what we've got, and it's not terrible. It's just, you know, not as good as it could be. That's all. And it's certainly much more preferable than Donald Trump, you know? Yes. That's my a squirrel opinion. Is, a squirrel is better than Donald Trump. At least you know a squirrel's going to get something done. <laughs> you know, a squirrel's going to run out and not get hit by a car. A squirrel's going to go and get food and shelter for the winter and stuff. A squirrel can do something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 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 Richie, we have a question. The, the wheel of torture, right? If yeah. you could put Donald Trump on a wheel of torture, who would you have <laughs> throwing at him, and what would you, what objects would you have being thrown at him? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got him laughing, y'all. Sir. <laughs> yeah, you got, you got me laughing. <laughs> I'll tell you this: I'd put him on the wheel of torture and make sure they were handcuffed, so you could never get off. <laughs> <That's what I'm... laughs> but I'll tell you a funny story about that. Do you remember when Sinbad had a late night show? Do you remember that one at all? I forgot yeah, about that. I, remember show. That. I forgot about that. Well, if you go if you go on YouTube, I showed up at the Sinbad show, and I had a new suit on. Uh, I forget about like an Armani suit or something, and Sinbad surprised me. Had a wheel of torture built, and put me on the wheel of torture. And he had a model come on and pour gook on top of me. And, man, I almost drowned. <laughs> I mean, I, it, wasn't, it wasn't fun, man. But it's, it's on YouTube. But just type in Sinbad Richard Bay, Wheel of Torture, and you'll see it. But, you know, I, try, 
I was I was a good sport, but I was dying up there. So I really sort of understand what uh, my guests went through when they rode on it. But uh, yeah, Trump certainly deserves to ride a wheel of torture. Well, yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with you on that one. Yes, me too. But, but you know what's going to be good enough? Election night when he loses. Because this guy is living in a world where he thinks he's only a winner. You know, he thinks because he gets these crowd, you know, a crowd, you know, in a stadium that everybody loves. You know what I can't believe? I can't believe in New York that people don't walk around like with uh, red paint or something and throw it over everything that says Trump on it. Because he's not, when I went to rent an apartment in New York, the realtor said to me, would you consider living in a Trump building? And I said, wow, why are you asking me that? And she said, well, a lot of people tell me that that I can show them any apartment, but they don't want to live in a place that has Trump's name on it. Now, And this was years ago. And I said, well, you know, now that you mention it, yeah, I don't want to live in a Trump building. But, you know, people didn't <laughs> like him back then. They, you know... They thought he was an egotistical buffoon back then, you know? Oh, yeah. He's, he's always a prick, always always been a prick. Yeah, he, he always was. I, right. I'll say, I'll say this, Richard, and you know, I, I'll speak on this matter for it, and then I'll get to my question for a moment. I think the reason why Donald Trump is so successful is because he speaks on the negativity that has always been in America. And he... he, he He's like a a, a capitalistic uh, spokesperson. You know what I mean? He, he you know, he, he's he, worse than for that. capitalism. For capitalism a- and everything, he he shows the most ignorant, racist, sexist, right? Um, um, uh, uh, almost megalomaniacish, like you know, attitude toward everything. And like you said, he 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 never loses. Well, that's because he rigs the game. You know, when you when you own the game, of course you're not going to lose because you you own the game. But of course, I what I think that on election night, what's going to happen is is that people are going to realize that there has to be a choice to be made because here in America, you know, they, everybody feels America is the biggest, we the baddest, and we the smartest, and we you know, when you can't even pronounce different countries, and right. you sit there and you mock different foreign leaders and policies and stuff. These things are hindering to not just yourself and your administration, it's hindering to us, the millions of people that live in this country. And that's the thing that's going to scare people is because war scares people. It always has. When the, the terror threat, it always will. It always happens and always will. And I think that when election night comes, a lot of his followers are going to wake up. They are. They're going to wake uh. up. They're going to they gonna they gonna realize you know, I what disagree this ain't funny with you. I disagree with you. A lot of his followers are just fucking crazy. They are crazy. Oh, yeah, I see them on Facebook. <laughs> you know? And let me tell you something. Thirty percent of this country has always been crazy. They've always been crazy. And, you know, they're spread out, but man, you'll you'll find them in more so in different regions of this country. And they've always been crazy and fearful. And so, you know, he's got a 30%, uh, you know, uh, basement, you know, that he can rest upon. But he's got to lose big. Because if he doesn't lose big, you know what he's going to say? They cheated me, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and uh, and Fox News is going to help him. One of the things that makes it worse now is that is that we have all we have all this this these crazy places where people go to get their information. You know, they they go to Breitbart, they go to Fox News, they listen to the the jerks on the radio. I worked with Sean Hannity. That guy's a jerk. He doesn't know anything, and he will say anything that puts a dollar in his pocket. He is he is he is just a shallow, ignorant. Um, you know he's he's got some talent. He can talk, but he doesn't know anything. He doesn't know anything about history. He doesn't know anything about anything outside of of 
what they tell him to say in terms of right-wing politics. He doesn't know anything about literature and books or theater, movies, world history, American history, really. He knows nothing. Um, you know, uh, but here's a story. I, wor- I worked on WABC radio in New York, and I was – are you still there? Yeah, we're here. Yeah? Oh, okay. yeah, we're here. I was, I was on right after Rush Limbaugh, Sean mm-hmm. Hannity, and then Michael Savage came on after me. So I was, you know, I was boxed in by all these people. So one day, before the Iraq War, I was looking at this evidence, and I was, you know, I was looking at, I, every day I would spend four or five hours researching before I went on the air, and it was knowable that it was bullshit. It was all bullshit. It was so flimsy. But people were so scared after 9/11, they were willing to. They, they were willing to be scared. Remember, they told us, "Oh, you know, get the plastic wrap and put it on your windows. They're coming with the yeah, dirty still... bomb." And right. mm-hmm. if, man, they everybody was in a state of like, uh, "Oh my God, any day now." And I know I had a little. Of, well, I lived in New York. I saw the plane go in. I I lived on the 38th floor of an apartment building. And I saw the plane flying down uh, the Hudson. I said to my girlfriend, I said, what the hell is this guy doing? Look at where he's flying. This was the second plane. And then it went right into the building and the fireball came out. So, I mean, you know, I, was, I lived there. I saw it out my living room window. Um, and wow. every time I saw a plane fly afterwards, I'd go, oh, my God, what the hell is this? You know? Because they they started flying planes over New York, you know, so yeah, yeah, you know, after you get a little post traumatic stress afterwards, but the whole country had it and just flipped out, and that's why it was so easily manipulated, you know. Mhm. It's fear. i fear is fear is a control toxin, you know. Of you fear what you don't know and and what you don't understand. So of course, when you're in fear, you want to be somewhere where you feel comfortable and only comfortability is the news media telling you, well, if you do this and, you know, the newspapers telling you, well, if you do this, you know, then you'll be fine. And, you know, at first we had the anthrax scare right after that. And remember everybody oh, did right, like, open up right. their mail and stuff. And, right, you know, right, it, right. you know, it, you know, every time you turn around, then we get the SARS. And remember, the SARS stuff came a couple right, years later. Right, oh, right, there, right, right. You know, right. every Anthrax. couple years we have some type of fear or some type Anthrax. of thing that happens. Yeah, yeah. remember <laughs> Ebola? Remember yeah, Ebola? Ebola, yep. Ebola was going to kill us all. We had, what, three three people in, in a country of 360 million who had Ebola? It was three or four people, and everybody was flipping? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, and it... They they tell you they tell you that you know that that the the numbers that you know they 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 see that the president count of how many people could die and they tell you these astronomical numbers that you know if this happens if it comes here in America we can project that almost two hundred people will die in two weeks and we project this you know it's, it's all speculation and everything but it's a play right. of words you know right. but. You have to be a person that understands media. You have to be a person that understands uh, uh, politics to really know what's going on. And that leads me to my question, by the way. Um, by you being the originator of so many things that we see now that clearly couldn't get away with it back in the 90s. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> clearly couldn't get away back in the 90s. I know, I know. Can you, you know, imagine? Listen, he, Donald Trump says fuck. He called somebody a motherfucker or something on the campaign trail. <laughs> he called yeah. uh, he, he called Ted yeah. Cruz a pussy. He he, he mocked an artistic a artistic uh, guy a kid and did this little <laughs> artistic like I guess he was trying to make fun of his artism and stuff. Right. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. This is the <laughs> I know wow. he's a guy that wants to be president. I know. <laughs> you know it, it it opens the doors and and it's so crazy. Um, damn it, you made me lose my question. Okay, my question is that <laughs> my question yeah. is that um, 
when you were I born, the door. Yeah, yeah. what was the what was the the one line that you did not want to cross, and um, did you ever cross it within your show? All right, and good. That's a great question. You know, thanks for asking that. No I never I never wanted to do something where somebody really got hurt, and I mean hurt in even more than a physical way. Now, there were a couple of times, I, I don't book the guests. I would, um, you know, I would come up with a concept for a show. But usually, the, you know, the producers would say, these are the guests for the show, we're doing a show, oh, you cheated on me. And I'd say, all right, I'm going to make a true confession, I'm going to be Detective Dick Bay, I'm going to do this or that. Mm-hmm. But there were a couple of times, there was there was one show, for instance, where we did a show where, uh, uh, daughters tell their mothers, young girls, young daughters, tell their mothers that they want to have sex. So they had booked somebody. They booked a 12-year-old girl with her mother, and on the air she's telling the mother that her all her friends are having sex. She wants to have sex. And the mother is, you know, sitting there going, no, you're not. And she goes, well, I am. You you know, you can't watch me all the time. And I said to this 12-year-old girl, I said, listen, how are you going to feel when you go back to school? And, you know, the the kids in school are going to see you talking to them like this on TV. What, what You know, how are you going to, how are you going to do, what are you going to say to them? And she said, they're going to see this? And I said, well, it's on television. Somebody will probably tell them or somebody will see it. She goes, I didn't know they were going to see this. They're going to see this. On, oh, they're going to. And I, so I said, stop the cameras. I walked into the control room and I said, look, you can't have a 12-year-old kid on this show. They're just, they're, they're just not ready for it, man. Mm-hmm. I said, everybody's got to be 16. And I said, we're not doing this. <clears throat> and they said, dude, you've got to do it. You've got to. I said, well, I'm not doing it. Yeah, and I said, look, I'm really sorry. You came all this way. I said, you know, I'll spend time talking to you. You know, you can have any of the Richard Bay show merchandise you want. But I said, we're not going to do this show, uh, you know. Uh, and and the producers were saying, the mother gave permission. I said, I didn't say it in front of the mother, but I said, I don't care what the mother said. I said, she's wrong. The 12, this 12-year-old girl doesn't understand what she's getting into. She's just, a, a, you know, she's in between being a baby and, you know, being a girl. So we didn't do that show. And there were a few other instances like that. I mean, there was, you know, there was one show where when the show ended, a girl said, "Oh, she said there were no cameras on, the show was over. I always mm-hmm. talk to the guests afterwards to make sure they're all right, you know. And this girl said, oh, she says, I don't know if I can go home. She goes, my boyfriend is going to kill me. And I said, no, nah, I, I, no, he won't. She goes, no, he will. He's threatened to kill me before. So mm-hmm. I stayed in the studio with the producers. We called social services. We called, uh, you know, like a safe house where she lives, mm-hmm. you know. So she could go there, um, and, and and we spent hours, you know, trying to take care of her before her plane took off for her to go home. So, you know, it wasn't like, and and on the other hand, most of the people that came on the show, you know, were pretty tough cookies. They volunteered. They knew what it was about. You know, they really, you know, they really didn't care. You know, they came. They had a good time. If it was a boyfriend or a girlfriend who found out her boyfriend was cheating, she put him on the wheel of torture. She probably knew he was a dog anyway, you know, and in the end, you know, they left. And, you know, it, it, it probably was of no great consequence. But, um, yeah, there is a line. And it's, uh, it's sometimes it's hard, you know, to discern where it is. But wherever I saw that line, you know, I would I would try to stop or I would, you know, try to go up and soften it, you know. But, uh, yeah, it's, you know, you're on TV. People are seeing what you're doing. And it's, uh, you know, 
they're your business is becoming uh you know a public uh, show now but that's true on any reality it's true on survivor it's true on uh, the apprentice it's true on everything you know there were there were a lot of people on the apprentice who when it was over they started to badmouth the show well nbc uh threatened to sue them if they didn't shout shut up you know and uh it was we didn't have that policy. And I'll tell you this. Usually, people send me letters thanking me. The best, there were two letters that I got that really made it all worthwhile. One was from a woman who said her son was paralyzed and was in the hospital. And she said, I go to see him every, you know, every day. And, you know, we're hoping for a cure, but we don't know what will happen. But every day I walk in and he goes, Mom, what do you think they'll have tomorrow? Will it be the Wheel of Torture? Or, uh, you know, will it be Judge Bay? Or or will it be Miss Big Butt? And she goes, he just lives for your show. And he's sitting there paralyzed in bed. And uh, she goes, well, your show makes him laugh. Your show gives him something to look forward to every day. And I just want to thank you. So that was one letter. And the second letter was from a woman in L.A. who said, you know, my son would come home from school with his girlfriend, and they'd go up to his bedroom, and I'd hear them laughing, and I'd say, you keep that door open up there. I want to, what are you laughing at, you guys? And they'd go, it's the Richard Bay show. And I said, what, what's a Richard Bay? And she goes, oh, it's a TV show, Bob. It's funny. And she goes, well, you leave that door open. And she said, I just came back from my son's funeral. He was shot in a drive-by. And she said, I'm devastated. And I turned the TV on just to take my mind off of it because I, I, I can't think of anything else. And she said, and your show came on. And she said, I watched it, and I saw what my son was watching, and I started to smile, and I felt connected with him again, and I understood why, you know, why he wanted to watch it every day. And she said, "I will never get over this, but I just wanted to thank you, you know, for bringing him, you know, that entertainment every afternoon when he came home from school, and and giving me a way to connect with him again." So those were two letters that I will never ever forget, you know, and. You know, with all the with all the bad stuff that comes down on you, those are two letters that I that you know that I cherish. Uh, and I'm not saying I'm not saying the show was any great shakes. So come on, it was. I would say this one, uh, uh, two, uh, two shows out of five were really funny, <clears throat> good entertainment. Two were okay, and then one every week was just a dog, was just something that I'd rather forget, you know, because, you know, we just shot it live. It didn't work out. The guests were no good. Somehow it didn't work. You whatever. So, but, we, but two out of five were pretty, I mean, I watch some of them now. I have them on DVDs. They still crack me up, and I was, and I was there, you know. I, I sort of know what's coming, and I started laughing, and I go, Oh my God! I didn't realize I was in the middle of it. I didn't realize how funny this was, you know. Right. I think no. I think that's something that's missing is the laughter. We don't get we yeah. don't we don't laugh anymore. Everything's just serious or oh, serious or damn. Right. Yeah, you know, tech. I'm you know. Well, well, I hate you know. Laugh it's all about if you watch the talk shows. If you watch Springer, I don't know how. Anybody can watch that every day. It's the same thing. Or Maury is the same thing. Who's the baby's father? At least we tried to mix it up and, you know, put new things on every day and experiment. You, you know, mm-hmm. you know, what's funny, Richard is, um, and uh, we was at a, we was at a local wrestling show, me and a uh, Game Boy, and I uh, think we sang to a younger fan. We're talking about talk shows, and of course the fan was a little younger, 
thought he knew about Maury was the he is not the father, and we was trying to tell him like you do know that Maury Povich used to be a serious show. Like he had a show. Right. We remember the Maury before it was you know the right, pop culture. Right. He is not the father and all this stuff. He, he looked in yeah, disbelief back when, like wow. Back when Connie Chung was uh was, Connie was Chung new. Was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, right. I, I know. Was a newscaster. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Mhm. Well, it is. Yeah. Um, with, 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 of course, Richard, you being in the 90s, you know, before the internet was big and social media and reality TV. Right. You had a great show. Did you ever compare yourself? Or did you ever watch your competition? Did you ever watch, like, the Montel Williams or the nah. James Jones or the Howard nah. Stern? Did you ever get anything nah. from them? Or you just well, you know, stay I, I will tell you this. Howard, Howard Stern had a show in the same... I shared my studio with Robin, you know, who's like his uh, sidekick co-host. Right. So Stern Stern shot his show at Channel 9. Morton Downey was there. Um, I don't know if you remember wow, him. He Morton was like... Downey, the, I remember his show. Yeah. You remember that one? Yeah, the big <laughs> mouth. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Big mouth, big mouth, uh-huh. yeah. And then there... And Stern was there, too. And, you know, I thought Stern did some outrageous stuff and really pioneering stuff. And, um, you know, I mean, I watched Stern, but, you know, I didn't think my show was like Stern. We had, you know, we had guests. Plus, we were five days a week, you know. At least the TV show, we weren't like that. But I will tell you that, you know, to some degree, probably Stern opened the door, you know, for a show like mine, yeah. And and then I opened the door, and, and then as soon as we, I mean, we were doing this from 92, but then by 90, what was it, syndicated, 95, I guess? By that yeah. time, everybody was, like, uh, you know, ripping off our act. I mean, you had Tempest, you had Danny Bonaducci, you had... Uh, Jenny Jones, Mark you had Sally, Je- Mark. W- My God, every show. Charles Perez, remember him? It was like <laughs> yeah. Oh, I forgot about Charles. <laughs> I forgot about him. I mean, <laughs> come on, man. It was just like nonstop, and they were all imitating what we were. Even Ricky, 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 Ricky Lake, Lake shot her pilot. You know, in 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 at Channel Nine, and used some of my producers. But we weren't syndicated yet. We were, uh, you know, uh, we were only in New York and L.A. in 92. They had something, they call it a slow rollout. So we didn't get full. We probably didn't come, I don't know, we might have come to Baltimore in 94. Uh, By that time, everybody was rolling out, you know, the same thing. In fact, we would have guests on, and two weeks later, I'd see them on Springer, the same guests. It's like they'd steal the same guests. <laughs> so, uh, you got to remember, remember how many of them there were? It was yeah, like I, I do. <laughs> I didn't really start thinking of them until you start naming them. And I'm like, you know what? Yeah, there was a lot of them. And all of them was using the same formula. Oh, wait, it, you, the yeah, same they formula, right. Everything was, was crazy and, and off the wall and... It was. It didn't didn't vibe. Remember that show? Vibe had a show in the late night. It was Vibe or Source Magazine had a show, and he tried to do like them them crazy wheels and yeah, crazy uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, crazy stuff like Richard. It was. And then don't forget uh, the John Edward crossing over shows. Man, everybody was talking to the dead. Oh, remember yeah, that in the nineties? Yeah, yeah. Oh man, that was, that was bad. <laughs> well, let's ask. Let's oh. ask this, um, Tech. Let's ask this. Now that we talked about the past, we we know about. You know how it came about. Let's talk about the ending. You know how how did it how sure. did it come to its abrupt ending, and what was the the you know the issues that came up with the show coming to a close? All right, here's a couple of things. First of all, in the last year we were on, there were a bunch of senators. There were so many of these talk shows on the air that Joe Lieberman, who was the guy that ran. Eventually, later on, he ran for vice president with Al Gore. He was a senator from Connecticut. Okay, yes. Yeah. And Bill Bennett, who was the secretary of education under Ronald Reagan. And there was another guy. I think it was Sam Nunn. Anyway, these three senators got together and said they had a hit list. And they asked all advertisers, 
not to advertise on these shows. And they had 10 shows. And I was on the list. But they had uh, Jenny Jones. They had uh, Ricky Lake. They had Jerry Springer. And so, and, and in fact, I have it here. I have, um, I have a, a TV Guide cover that says, uh, talk shows, have they gone too far? People forget it was, you remember, uh, and I forget what year it was, there's one year where everything gets blamed on rap music. Another year, everything gets blamed on comic books. Well, there was a year back then when everything was blamed on talk shows. You know, it was violence, it was crudity, it was sexism, it was uh, you know, rape, it was, everything came off of the fact that it was the talk shows. The same way they, you know, rap every once in a, you know, every once in a while, rap, there's a whole, me, and then everybody forgets about it. All of a sudden, it's sort of like the anthrax. Oh, anthrax, yeah. anthrax, you know, and then everybody forgets about anthrax. Oh, talk shows, talk shows, they're terrible. Oh, rap music, rap music, it's terrible. Oh, comic books. And that was in the 50s. They, right. you know, they, they tried mm-hmm. to clean up the comic books. So, you know, and everybody stampedes. So there was, there was partially that, which was all of the attention that these people in government were giving to talk shows. But then, and my management, you know, the people in management came and said, listen, you know, can you, first of all, they wouldn't let us have girls in bikinis on the show. So they started to come down. I said, for so many years, they left us alone. We created this successful format. And then all of a sudden, we're now famous. They're making tons of money. You know, I'm not doing too badly myself. But all of a sudden, they want to change everything. And they fired the producer. They did this. They did that. And they came to me and they said, why don't you try some different things? So I said, all right. So I did a show. Uh, I did one show that was a takeoff on Rosie. I called it Rosie O'Donnell because she was saying she was the queen of nice. So I did a show, right. the Richie show, where I was the king of nice, but I was really this mean guy on the air. And she had a baby, so I had a baby in a crib. It was really a doll, and I'd throw pizza at it. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of nice kids, I had Bay's brats who came on and insulted me. And, you know, it was a takeoff on Rosie. And then the other thing was, I said, wow, this is an election year. I've never seen Jennifer Flowers on any television show. And then I read in the papers that she was booked on Rolanda. But Rolanda was another one. You remember Rolanda? I remember Rolanda. Yeah. Rolanda yeah. was. Rolanda, right. yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So she was so she was booked on Rolanda and the day and then I'm reading the trade papers and it says she shows up and they tell her go home, we cancel the show. And then there's another woman who said she had an affair with Bill Clinton and she's supposed to be on Sally Jesse Raphael and a week later I read the papers and they said she showed up and they said, uh, we've switched topics, we're not gonna do that anymore. So I'm going, Hmm, what the hell's going on here? This is an election year, and I haven't seen any of these women on TV. This is before Monica Lewinsky. So I called Jennifer Flowers up, and she said, uh, every time I'm booked on something, it gets canceled. So I said, all right, I'll book you on my show. And I said, everybody thinks I'm just this silly, crazy talk show host, but I've done you know, serious interviews. Come on, and I'll, I'll talk to you. So I went to management, and I said, could I book her? And they said, yeah, but you'll have to shoot it on your own time. Uh, so I said, sure, fine. I'll shoot an extra show. But And they said, you're not going to have an audience because uh, the audience booker isn't going to work on your show. They're working on that show. They'll work on the regular show. So I had an empty audience. So I said, all right, turn the cameras around on me. And I stood in the empty audience and I said, there's nobody in my audience today. And that's going to make some people very happy because they don't want you to hear what my next guest is going to say. Thank I you said, know. you you haven't seen her anywhere else on TV. Maybe this won't even get on television and I'm just talking to nobody out there. But if it is, you should watch because this is probably the only place you're ever going to see Jennifer Flowers. 
And then I came back down and I had an interview with Jennifer Flowers. And, you know, during the interview, she said uh, that she had gotten pregnant with Bill Clinton's baby. And she went to him and she said, um, you know, she told him. And I said, well, he he didn't tell her to get an abortion, but he didn't say he was going to marry her either. And I said, did you hope he was going to say, I'm going to divorce Hillary and marry you? She said, yeah, I was kind of hoping that, but I knew, I kind of knew he wouldn't do it, you know? Um, anyway, <laughs> they had just, re- they had just renewed my contract in September. I shot this show. They saw it all. It was on tape. We had it for two weeks and we put it on the air in October. It airs. Half the people are calling up going, Richard Bay, you son of a bitch, how could you do this to our president? Half of them calling up and saying, thank God, I never saw anything like this before. Um, And the ratings are great. And the day after it airs, I get called in the office and told the show is out of production. And I said, was this because of the Jennifer Flowers show? And they didn't give me an answer. And I said, you know, you just renewed my contract. I said, you know, you're paying me a lot of money. I said, and they said, you'll be paid every week. But, you you know, you you just can't say anything about this. And uh, you can't work anywhere else. But, uh, and I was making a lot of money. <clears throat> so actually in my mind I said, oh, my God, take the girlfriend to Monaco. And, <laughs> and I said, my parents. Uh, you know, I sent my parents on a yacht across the Mediterranean. Um, you know, I flew out to L.A. and, uh, you know, stayed with friends in L.A. and partied. You know, it it was incredible. I thought I'll do this for a year and then uh, I'll go back to work. But, you know, after a year, I eventually ended up on radio. And uh, that's the story of how it all ended. It was a great year, though, man. If you ever, you know, imagine looking down at a paycheck every week with five figures in it, and you don't even have to work. Man, that is great. That's a dream, ain't it? (laughs) That's a dream. (laughs) It's pretty damn good. 